The psychology of inaction is one of the chief reasons why some towns and cities are dying with the dry rot. Take the city of X, for example. You'll recognize the city by its description if you are familiar with this part of the country. Sunday blue laws have closed up all the restaurants on Sunday. Railroad trains must slow down to twelve miles an hour while passing through the city. Keep off the grass signs are prominently displayed in the parks. Unfavorable city ordinances of one sort or another have driven the best industries to other cities. On every hand, one may see evidence of restraint. The people of the streets show signs of restraint in their faces and in their manner and in their walk. The mass psychology of the city is negative. The moment one gets off the train at the depot, this negative atmosphere becomes depressingly obvious and makes one want to take the next train out again. The place reminds one of a graveyard, and the people resemble walking ghosts. They register no signs of action. The bank statements of the banking institutions reflect this negative, inactive state of mind. The stores reflect it in their show windows and in the faces of their salespeople. I went into one of the stores to buy a pair of hose. A young woman with bobbed hair, who would have been a flapper if she hadn't been too lazy, threw out a box of hose on the counter. When I picked up the box, looked the hose over, and registered a look of disapproval on my face, she languidly yawned, "They're the best you can get in this dump." Dump? She must have been a mind reader, for dump was the word that was in my mind before she spoke. The store reminded me of a rubbish dump. The city reminded me of the same. I felt the stuff getting into my own blood. The negative psychology of the people was actually reaching out and gathering me in. Maine is not the only state that is afflicted with a city such as the one I have described. I could name others, but I might wish to go into politics some day. Therefore, I will leave it to you to do your own analyzing and comparing of cities that are alive with action and those that are slowly dying with the dry rot of inaction. I know of some business concerns that are in this same state of inaction, but I will omit their names. You probably know some too. Many years ago, Frank A. Vanderlip, who is one of the best known and most capable bankers in America, went to work for the National City Bank of New York City. His salary was above the average from the start, for the reason that he was capable and had a record of successful achievement that made him a valuable man. He was assigned to a private office that was equipped with a fine mahogany desk and an easy chair. On the top of the desk was an electric push button that led to a secretary's desk outside. The first day went by without any work coming to his desk. The second and third and fourth days went by without any work. No one came in or said anything to him. By the end of the week, he began to feel uneasy. Men of action always feel uneasy when there is no work in sight. The following week, Mr. Vanderlip went into the president's office and said, "Look here, you are paying me a big salary and giving me nothing to do, and it is grating on my nerves." The president looked up with a lively twinkle in his keen eyes. Now I have been thinking, Mr. Vanderlip continued, while sitting in there with nothing to do, of a plan for increasing the business of this bank. The president assured him that both thinking and plans were valuable, and asked him to continue with his interview. I have thought of a plan, Mr. Vanderlip went on, that will give the bank the benefit of my experience in the bond business. I propose to create a bond department for this bank and advertise it as a feature of our business. What? This bank advertise? Queried the president. Why we have never advertised since we began business. We have managed to get along without it. Well, this is where you are going to begin advertising," said Mr. Vanderlip. "And the first thing you are going to advertise is this new bond department that I have planned." Mr. Vanderlip won. Men of action usually win. That is one of their distinctive features. The National City Bank also won because that interview was the beginning of one of the most progressive and profitable advertising campaigns ever carried on by any bank. With the result that the National City Bank became one of the most powerful financial institutions of America, there were other results also that are worth naming. Among them, the result that Mr. Vanderlip grew with the bank, as men of action usually grow in whatever they help to build, until finally he became the president of that great banking house. 
In the lesson on imagination, you learned how to recombine old ideas into new plans. But no matter how practical your plans may be, they will be useless if they are not expressed in action. To dream dreams and see visions of the person you would like to be or the station in life you would like to obtain are admirable, provided you transform your dreams and visions into reality through intensive action. There are men who dream but do nothing more. There are others who take the visions of the dreamers and translate them into stone and marble and music and good books and railroads and steamships. There are still others who both dream and transform these dreams into reality. They are the dreamer-doer types. There is a psychological as well as an economic reason why you should form the habit of intensive action. Your body is made up of billions of tiny cells that are highly sensitive and amenable to the influence of your mind. If your mind is of the lethargic, inactive type, the cells of your body become lazy and inactive also, just as the stagnant water of an inactive pond becomes impure and unhealthful, so will the cells of an inactive body become diseased. Laziness is nothing but the influence of an inactive mind on the cells of the body. If you doubt this, the next time you feel lazy, take a Turkish bath and have yourself well rubbed down thereby stimulating the cells of your body by artificial means, and see how quickly your laziness disappears. Or, a better way than this, turn your mind towards some game of which you are fond, and notice how quickly the cells of your body will respond to your enthusiasm, and your lazy feeling will disappear. The cells of the body respond to the state of mind in exactly the same manner that the people of a city respond to the mass psychology that dominates the city. If a group of leaders engage in sufficient action to give a city the reputation of being a live-wire city, this action influences all who live there. The same principle applies to the relationship between the mind and the body. An active, dynamic mind keeps the cells of which the physical portions of the body consist in a constant state of activity. The artificial conditions under which most inhabitants of our cities live have led to a physical condition known as auto-intoxication, which means self-poisoning through the inactive state of the intestines. Most headaches may be cured in an hour's time by simply cleansing the lower intestines with an enema. Eight glasses of water a day and a reasonable amount of physical action, popularly known as exercise, will take the place of the enema. Try it for a week, and then you will not have to be urged to keep it up, for you will feel like a new person unless the nature of your work is such that you get plenty of physical exercise and drink plenty of water in the regular course of your duties. On two pages of this book, enough sound advice could be recorded to keep the average person healthy and ready for action during 16 of the 24 hours of the day, but the advice would be so simple that most people would not follow it. The amount of work that I perform every day and still keep in good physical condition is a source of wonderment and mystery to those who know me intimately. Yet there is no mystery to it, and the system I follow does not cost anything. Here it is, for your use if you want it. First, I drink a cup of hot water when I first get up in the morning before I have breakfast. Second, my breakfast consists of rolls made of whole wheat and bran, breakfast cereal, fruit, soft-boiled eggs once in a while, and coffee. For luncheon I eat vegetables, most any kind, whole wheat bread and a glass of buttermilk. Supper, a well-cooked steak once or twice a week, vegetables, especially lettuce, and coffee. Third, I walk an average of ten miles a day, five miles into the country and five miles back, using this period for meditation and thought. Perhaps the thinking is as valuable as a health builder as the walk. Fourth, I lie across a straight-bottomed chair, flat on my back, with most of my weight resting on the small of my back, with my head and arms relaxed completely until they almost touch the floor. This gives the nervous energy of my body an opportunity to balance properly and distribute itself, and ten minutes in this position will completely relieve all signs of fatigue, no matter how tired I may be. Fifth, I take an enema at least once every ten days, and more often if I feel the need of it, using water that is a little below blood temperature, with a tablespoonful of salt in it, chest and knee position. Sixth, I take a hot shower bath, followed immediately by a cold shower, every day, usually in the morning when I first get up. These simple things I do for myself, 
Mother Nature attends to everything else necessary for my health. I cannot lay too much stress upon the importance of keeping the intestines clean, for it is a well-known fact that the city dwellers of today are literally poisoning themselves to death by neglecting to cleanse their intestines with water. You should not wait until you are constipated to take an enema. When you get to the stage of constipation, you are practically ill, and immediate relief is absolutely essential. But if you will give yourself the proper attention regularly, just as you attend to keeping the outside of your body clean, you will never be bothered with the many troubles which constipation brings. For more than fifteen years, no single week ever passed without my having a headache. Usually I administered a dose of aspirin and got temporary relief. I was suffering with auto-intoxication and did not know it for the reason that I was not constipated. When I found out what my trouble was, I did two things, both of which I recommend to you. Namely, I quit using aspirin, and I cut down my daily consumption of food nearly one half. Just a word about aspirin, a word which those who profit by its sale will not like. It affords no permanent cure of headache. All it does might be compared to a lineman that cuts the telegraph wire while the operator is using that wire in a call for aid from the fire department to save the burning building in which he is located. Aspirin cuts or deadens the line of nerve communication that runs from the stomach or the intestinal region, where auto-intoxication is pouring poison into the blood, to the brain, where the effect of that poison is registering its call in the form of intense pain. Cutting the telegraph line over which a call for the fire department is being sent does not put out the fire, nor does it remove the cause to deaden, with the aid of a dose of aspirin, the nerve line over which a headache is registering a call for help. You cannot be a person of action if you permit yourself to go without proper physical attention until auto-intoxication takes your brain and kneads it into an inoperative mass that resembles a ball of putty. Neither can you be a person of action if you eat the usual devitalized concoction called white bread, which has had all the real food value removed from it, and twice as much meat as your system can digest and properly dispose of. 